Okay, we invite the first panel who will, that will be moderated by Gloria Ortega, General Manager of Bancard. So, uh, Gloria, please join us. Gloria is a national of uh, Paraguay. She was the first female industrial engineer in the country. And she was the first to introduce a salary payment by ATMs and uh, a online. She is a she was the general and regional manager of six Millicom international subsidiaries in Latin America and Africa and has led many multinational large scale projects in multiple multicultural environments. And she is currently the general manager of Bancard SA, a company focusing on achieving greater inclusion, adoption, and finan financial formalization in Paraguay. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. To make it very simple, I installed the first ATM in Paraguay 34 years ago. Many of you guys maybe thought that uh, when God created the world, ATMs was one of the, because none of you can imagine the, your lives without ATMs, right? So the, the guys that said yes, now I know how, which are old and which is young here. <laughs> uh, anyway, after that I also installed the first broadband services in Paraguay, and then I realized that putting technologies and then after a couple of years that you put technologies, the world changes and people change and then people forget how was the world before that. So since then I decided that my life was going to be about putting technologies for the good of people. Here I am trying to put technologies in public employment services. So let's welcome Carmen, Liz, uh, to the panel. Um, we are going to talk now about uh, what but everybody is boring, which is technology. Uh, and also Karen, they are my, my guests here. Uh, let me try to see. Yeah. This is much better. Uh, you hear me well? Okay, good. Wow, since I think until now we were all talking about how do we make population more digital, how do we change the attitude of uh, the young people looking for a job? How do, do we inject our people, the willing to learn for the rest of their lives? But now we're going to take a look maybe at the people and the processes and the technologies that we have, we have today in the countries that we call public offices or public employment services strategies. And I keep hearing uh, this recommendation about look at your data, look at your data, look at your data, manage your data, uh, watch your data. But where do we get this data from? Well, a lot of this data should come from the registers we do when we contact citizens as governments. What are we doing? How do we track the events where we, as government, intervene in people's life? And then, out of that data, what can we do? So I would like each one of you to introduce yourselves. I think you already know Carmen, and then Liz, and Karen. So if they can very shortly introduce yourselves, and then we go through questions. But we were talking this morning, and we decided that we want you to be participants. So there's going to be space not for questions. We want you to also tell us what you are doing in your countries to improve public employment services and what is the role you think that PES should have in the future in your own countries. Carmen? So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Carmen Pages. I'm the chief of the Labor Markets and Social Security Division at the uh, Inter-American Development Bank. I want to take this opportunity also to thank my, our partners in this event, uh, NASDAQ, uh, OECD, and, uh, and, and AMS, uh, the wall of um, public employment services for being great partners and putting together uh, this, this, um, this excellent event. So thank you so much to all of you. 
Thank you, Carmen. My name is Liz Wilkie. Um, for those of you that weren't here yesterday, I am LinkedIn's tech policy and future of work researcher. So I am responsible for the building out and the execution of our global future of work research agenda. And also I'd like to thank uh, Carmen and all the co-organizers for inviting me and, and my partners here today. Hi, so my name is Karen McGuire. I'm from the OECD, which is an international organization uh, based in uh, Paris. Um, so I'm uh, currently in charge of a team that looks at specifically issues of local employment um, and skills, but also uh, thinking about social innovation, and, and that's something that maybe we could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, here today. Um, maybe just a quick raise of hands. How many people were here yesterday so I can know how many people might hear some of the same things? Okay. <laughs> All right, just since, uh, since I know Liz and I were here yesterday as well on panels, we just want to see how we can spice it up a little bit, but uh, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, well, we know now that uh, demography, globalization, uh, mismatches in the offer and demand of employment services, inequity, we keep hearing those, right? What do we do about it? So, question is, what are the key trends that public employment services should follow closely to remain relevant actors in the future of work in the countries? Uh, so everybody will have a couple of minutes because we want to save time to ask also you about that. Carmen? Well, I think there are three trends that PS should be watching closely. Um, these are polarization, these are the changing nature of work, and this is aging. Polarization because technology is actually reducing the demand of a number of occupations which are easy to automate. And in increasing the, the relative demand of occupations that are hard to automate. And this has enormous repercussions in terms of distribution. Uh, occupation, uh, easy to automate jobs tend to be located in the middle class, so the middle class has taken a big hit. Uh, it has some gender uh, implications because occupations that uh, women tend to be more concentrated on occupations that are easy to automate. 19% of men and 21% of women are at risk of autom um, automation in, in Latin America, for example. And, and also age. Uh, it depends a lot how this adjustment takes place, whether it's going to focus on young people, preventing them to enter in these jobs that have lower uh, demand, or in middle-aged people, because some of these middle-aged people are going to be substituted by technology and, and, and dismissed. So these are trends that we need to, close, uh, to look closely and, and to, so we can design the appropriate uh, strategies to face them. Just very quickly, second trend, changing wall of work. It turns out that PS tend to be focused on supporting people to find salaried employment full-time and, and in, in one company. Well, it turns out that a lot of work is changing, and now it, we have an increase in employment that is self-employment in nature. It's task-based, so people have three, four, five, sometimes six tasks in different, for different employers, all at the same time. Some of this work is low quality and low pay, and maybe you don't want to direct people there. But some of this work, particularly in the context of developing economies, is high pay relative to local wages. So you may want to offer that as an opportunity to your, to your members. And, and I think this is, uh, so this is an important opportunity, I think, that needs to be tracked closely. And third, aging. A significant piece of data. We know the world is aging as a whole. But did you know that Latin America is aging twice as fast as the rest of the world? It's, it's going to take, and in some countries, three times as fast. What it took 60 years to complete in the UK, which is to go from 10 to 20% of people with more than 65 years old, it's going to take actually one third of the time in some of our countries, in the Latin American and Caribbean countries. So think about it, what it means, it's almost yeah, you go to bed young and you get up and you're old as a country. So think about it in terms of pipeline planning, right? Uh, making sure that your talent doesn't go away and suddenly you don't have uh, the people that you need but also what it means in terms of planning for pensions and so on. So this is a huge task and PES are located in a central place to help it, to help uh, plan it for it. Sorry, Carmen, I have just a real question, just, you know, because I, I've, I've been asking myself this. So if we think that I mean, middle class maybe, uh, or people who is in risk of 
of automation or has been already automated. Is this the segment of people visiting our pests in most of the countries in Latin America? Uh, or is it more high, high educated people? Actually, what we know for, from the studies is that the most at risk are people that are in routine jobs. And these tend to be production workers so far. I mean, production workers. So uh, you, maybe you tell me whether these are the work people that visit your UPS. But a lot of production workers. Also, people that are in white collar administrative jobs. So maybe, I don't know, this uh, may be also another segment. Uh, which is now rapidly changing into task based um, and other forms of job based uh, tasks so so I think um, these uh, these are the two occupations administratives and uh, people in in production line that are being more uh, that are the ones that have been f um, more automated so far. However, we know that this is changing very rapidly, and new occupations now are entering into the list. So I don't know. I think uh, it depends on the countries. It depends on the constituency. Each country has a different client base for the PS. But uh, I, I assume that in many countries, yes. And if they are not coming, they may be coming very soon because these are the guys at risk right now. Lise, what do you think about it? Uh, actually, Carmen stole all my best answers. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I will just add a, a couple of things. I so have more questions for you, in case, <laughs> just in case. Um, I, do, I think aging is a, is a really important one, especially because there is a very global dynamic to aging that is mediated through migration. So, for instance, lots of care work in the United States is actually performed by immigrants, right, who are doing what I think would be effectively middle-skilled or high-skilled or well-paid work from their home countries, but we tend, right, not to pay very well in the United States. And actually, as Western and developed economies age, there is going probably very likely to be an increasing either demand for low-skilled migrant work uh, who can fill those jobs or even medium-skilled migrant work who can fill those jobs. Um, but also that will, if, if we can't figure out how to ease those tensions, there will be increasing pressure for further automation that will, that will then potentially be exported. So, I mean, I think there's maybe not, I mean, I think public employment services would do well to think from a global perspective about how automation is actually changing um, and aging is sort of changing at the global level and what that means, right, for migration pressures in and out of their own country. I definitely think that... Um, production jobs are very likely to decrease and they're very likely to be replaced with the serviceification. Um, and, I, and I know lots of economies are already in services, but they tend to be in sort of very low skilled services uh, that, that are sort of highly informalized, right? Like, uh, you know, all, all of us have been to the markets where sort of vendors are selling exactly the same thing, right, for miles and miles. And it's, it's very informalized and it's very low skilled. And there is an opportunity actually, I think, to think, to keep an eye on what are the services jobs uh, that are being um, created, right, in hotels, in, uh, in um, experiential uh, consumption. Um, because, you know, we, we, we can't create a, a country full of sort of AI engineers and coders. We need to find sort of high quality service jobs. And I think more and more good quality middle class production jobs are going to be replaced by sort of artisanal service and experiential jobs. And we're definitely, I think, in a slump between that transition, especially because, you know, many economies are sort of centered around, right, the jobs that used to exist. Um, I think um, also the changing nature of work is an important one, and which also has a global dimension, right? So platform-based contract and gig work is actually rapidly expanding the opportunity for people who have a fast internet connection and who speak English uh, to do work from their home at any hour that they want to. And so what we're seeing, for instance, in India is that this is, this is rapidly expanding the opportunities for people who were previously discriminated against in the labor market uh, and women who have primary caretaking responsibilities to actually participate in the labor market on their own terms and to be uh, household earners and contributors. I think we'll very likely see with the rise of automation that more and more tasks not only can be automated, but that different tasks can be bundled and shipped out uh, to be performed by anybody across the world. And I think that this will act also affect, to Carmen's point about the sort of, um, uh, sort of portfolio approach to income generation, that this is likely to, to be an opportunity for people to supplement a uh, portion of their income by doing sort of task-based online work. Obviously, that's not without its own equality implications about who has access to high-speed high internet and who actually learns to speak English. Um, yes, Lisa, that's... I was going to ask that question. I mean, 
how big is now the shift between employment and just freelance working, I'm not sure that we are ready in the countries to, to take this trend from the social security point of view, from the income, from the invoicing and from the tracking. I mean, I think that the, the world is going faster than regulation on this one. Who will take care of that freelancer when he gets 85? Uh, is he paying for his own retirement? Is he paying for his health? Uh, that's a big question that's rising from, from this uh, uh, expanding and exponential trend. But I do have a question for you, Liz. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, but this is I, I, I've been asking. Many public employment services, they say, why should I help people with a job match? There is LinkedIn for that. How do you see the role of public employment services versus I mean, what you are already offering, is it complementary? Uh, is it, I mean, the self-service of looking for your best job <laughs> online? Uh, is this the only way in the future? Or what will be a role of, of, you know, someone taking care of someone else who's coming to a public employment services? Yeah, so I, thank you, I love that question. Um, we've actually experimented a little bit in the United States where um, Ephraim can talk a little more about this in a later panel, where we're actually working with workforce development boards and public employment services. So what we're finding is that the sort of model of uh, public and so employment services as, as are, are sort of traditionally like a bridge, right, between an unemployed person and gainful employment. And I think instead of, um, where the public employment services job is to find a job for an unemployed person that will actually see their job is to facilitate their access to services that help them sort of take ownership of their job search. So what we've seen is that we've been training people in public employment services to help job seekers use LinkedIn as a tool to build a profile, to search for jobs, uh, to make connections because we're finding a lot more these days that professional connections are incredibly important drivers of job <coughs> mobility and job uh, transition. And so I can definitely envision a world where actually public employment services take LinkedIn and all the other tools that are available and really help people who come in who may not be aware of these tools or how to use them best to really coach and train and help support their own autonomous use of, of LinkedIn and, and other job search tools. Wow, that's fantastic. Karen, what are your thoughts around? Okay, well, as your third, uh, third here, um, maybe a, a couple of thoughts. So first, um, maybe to add to, to what's been said, the location of those jobs, I think, is going to be a very important issue to think about. I mean, a lot of countries are still, um, there's still movement towards urban areas. We saw yesterday that a lot of OECD countries are experiencing most of their job growth in capital regions. Uh, and we see that there are a lot of uh, regions that are losing population. And so understanding and being able to make the links with where jobs are available, not just those jobs in that current location or that district of a public employment service agency is going to be something to, to, to think about. Um, another, just on the nature of the, the work contracts, because that's of course going to be a big issue. Um, so just, you know, the OECD, when they've looked at some of the statistics in OECD countries, they, they say that, the, you know, some of the estimates that have been done, it's between 0.5 up to 3% of a particular economy that is considered this platform economy. So, um, so it's still not the norm, if you will, um, but it's something that, you know, folks are really trying to understand better with different data sources. And, and just yesterday, there was a gentleman here named Peter Criticos who was talking um, at the break about how they have been trying to do research and really match up sort of um, tax records and other things because, you know, how certain drivers are recording their income, it's coming through a different, a, a different category. And so being able to really understand the, the, the sort of amplitude of, of some of these trends is going to require a lot more interesting data analysis, um, maybe by, you know, different, uh, different parties, researchers, national governments, public employment services, LinkedIn, others. So th there's going to be a lot of work to contribute to understanding that. Um, you know, in the OECD, about one in nine are on what we call temporary contracts. Um, and, you know, when we looked at what happened in Europe since the crisis, about 60% of the new jobs that were created were on temporary contracts. And so this is something that 
60 percent of the, the new creations. Of course, there's a big stock of already existing jobs. Uh, it's not, uh, um, but but just the idea that um, that this is something that we have to continually monitor, um, and it's something where um, also the self-employment. And I think that's another area where the sort of fiscal systems and um, and incentive structures for what is considered uh, self-employment and is this. Um, an opportunity is this uh, a sort of a default, um, and and how to how to use it. So, um, you know, overall trends in the OECD are that self-employment has generally been about stable. This is shifting composition in in what kinds of occupations are part of the self-employment pool, um, and there's also uh, some signs that maybe the quality of that self-employment is not as great as we might think because we have you know, sort of the dream of, you know, we talked yesterday about the 100 days of work per year and, and, and all of those things and, you know, the moms who are trying to maybe do something between 2 and 3 a.m., uh, you know, while the kids are sleeping. But, um, but there, the, some of the signs are that there, um, there's a lot of fiscal rules that are, that are creating what we call dependent self-employment. So these are jobs that are not, uh, you know, it's like you're a salaried employee, but legally you're not really, and so, so we're concerned a little bit about what that means for the systems that you were just talking about earlier, Gloria. Um, another is just that there's an increasing share of, of self-employed that are in these firms that don't have other employees. Um, so a bit more the freelancer type than the, the more self-employment that's for job creation purposes. And so that's another consideration for, for thinking about job creation. Um, and another is just that there's an increasing share in um, the self-employed that are working part-time. So one can, what, you know, it, you have to sort of dig, dig a bit deeper to understand what that means, but that's something to, to keep in mind because if it's part-time, maybe there's not enough work, or maybe it's a lifestyle choice. These are all things that, you know, you have to, you have to do different analyses in different places on what's going on. Um, I think also maybe what that means um, in terms of these trends is also the, the, to think about the incentive systems that are given to public employment services, how are they, how their performance is being measured, and what does that mean, you know, is it, is it the person got a placement, the person got a placement in what kind of job, is the person there six months later, you know, some, some systems they, they track this and even pay uh, by performance. Um, and to make sure that somebody is in a job for a longer period of time, but if we have increasing temporary, we have increasing other kinds of uh, employment options, what, what does that mean for the trajectory and how can technology help us understand that trajectory? So um, maybe I'll just stop there, but, um, but of course I would uh, echo um, all of the thoughts about the polarization in the, in the labor market and the demographics and, and what was raised yesterday about the, the youth, because um, while the aging is rapid, you still have that big bubble in many countries of, uh, of, young, of young people and the sort of lifetime long-term consequences of having them not being effectively engaged in the labor market is going to be a big challenge. Uh, and I think also we're seeing, and even in some of the uh, OECD countries, that what, what might be called an overqualification challenge that also creates a lot of frustration and, and discontent. So a lot of, lot of big, big issues to deal with. Well, I, I love numbers. So I ask them, try to, try to say some things that are memorable so that you can take home. And I can, I can record uh, three or two. Three percent of... Uh, vacancies, let's say, are already platform-based. I mean, it looks small, but I'm sure it's growing faster. 3% of jobs are already platform-based. The second number that, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me, carrying is that 60% is already temporary contracts. That's, I mean, wow. Are we ready in the public employment services to facilitate uh, people coming into a temporary contract? And then the, the last one I heard, and I think it's also memorable, it's uh, that what Liz is said, you know. Why don't you teach people to use LinkedIn when they come into your public employment services? Because somehow that could help people to self-manage their future in a platform. And, and in, in some countries, like mine, being digital, you, you cannot learn to be digital. Being digital is using tools and technology to create value in your life. So that might also be a good idea. So let's jump to the second question, and then you can you know, write comments if you agree, if you disagree, if you want to ask something. So we leave some space for you. The second is um, all the changes we just talked about, they create significant challenges for public employment services, including the key performance indicator of our teams out there. 
uh, impacting on citizens' lives. Because when you go to a public employment services, it's because you're looking for a better life. How do we measure performance in this complex world? So what tools do you think that public employment services should have at hand to support job seekers and firms in the next century? And I will add also to orientators and facilitators, what are the tools, the minimum tools that a PES should have to be equipped for this challenge in the future. Carmen? So thanks, a great question. Uh, I just want to take one second before I answer this to go to the social security uh, yeah. challenge that you mentioned before. I think the answer is that social security is not prepared to deal with this. And, and, and we've had, uh, we have a lab at the IDB which is called the Retirement Savings Lab that is helping countries to deal with this challenge. And one of the things we found is, for example, we wanted to register the workers of the social, for example, one of the platforms, I'm not going to say the name, but one of the platforms, we wanted to make sure that when they register in the platform, a driving uh, platform, they can actually be registered in Social Security immediately. And, start, and from the platform itself, the, the money gets discounted. Well, guess what? Social Security is not ready to, to, to get workers through this new channel. So as we think in technology, as we think in PS, we also have to think in ways that technology can support all these new ways in which we want to formalize people. So that's just a food for thought. And coming back to the technologies for PS, I think two types of technologies that we are particularly excited about are, one is what we would call guidance tools, <coughs> and the other is enhanced matching tools. Guidance, guidance tools. This is, uh, these are the tools that you can create today uh, based on basically the convergence of big data, uh, natural language processing tools, and machine learning tools. So today, the fact that we have big data almost in real time with a lot of granularity that can come from the online post, uh, job postings, it can come from the your own data, PS postings, it can come from, from social networks, all this data process can tell us a lot on what, what are the emerging jobs, what are the declining occupations, and also can help people to go from, let's say, a, dec uh, an, a declining occupation to an emerging occupation. So think about it today, you put your GPS, you can go from here to, let's say, to, to, to Union Station or maybe farther to the airport, whatever. I, I envision a world in which from my phone I could have my, my, my career path in which I could say, today I'm an economist, um, maybe I got tired of this, I want to be something else, or I want to find jobs in this new sector, how, how, could, I get, how could I get there? What's the shortest route that's going to take me there? Or I can have, uh, for example, I want to study, I want to study for this, what should I study? And, and we are developing, for example, a tool uh, with Fundación Telefónica, which is a chatbot that's going to um, help you to find um, which course do you have to take, and what is the best course actually of, the, sup of the, the, the ones that are available that is most suited for what you're looking for. And all this can be done through IA uh, tools that help you to make all those. Th they don't make the decisions for you, but they definitely provide you with uh, maybe a, a short list from which you can decide from. And the second set of tools is what I, I call at the beginning uh, IA enhanced uh, matching, which has uh, a new set of tools available today, that instead of finding uh, my match in terms of vacancies and, and jobs, through keywords or occupations, uh, it's able to understand what are the skills that are part of my occupation. And if I've been in this occupation for a certain number of years, it means I probably have a good, uh, a good knowledge of all these. Uh, I'm competent in a number of these skills. And then, um, because it does this for every occupation, it's able to search for jobs that use my talents, even though if they are in, not in my occupation. So it provides me with a, an enhanced set of opportunities that uh, a traditional match would not find for me. And I think this is something that uh, we can all benefit from. Fantastic. Liz? Uh, great. I think, so there's... Uh, without touching too much on what exactly the KPI should be for every PES, I mean, I think you're, what you said is that people come to public employment looking for a better life. 
And I think, I mean, I would sort of open it up to the group that what, there's a possibility to let the people who come to public employment services define what that better outcome looks like for them, uh, figure out how to measure it, and then track public employment success against a person's own self-identified measure of betterment, right? I may, I may want a job with more pay, but I may actually really care about flexibility in order to <coughs> caretake for my family or people that need it. I may really want a job that helps me to travel or to learn new skills or to write and I might be willing to take a pay cut for that and so it's I mean especially as we are sort of entering an age where ideally public employment services can bring in all of the tools right LinkedIn is one of them um, but there is lots of money right by private companies to help match job seekers to jobs, LinkedIn, Indeed, uh, Career Builder, Monster, all of, there's lots and lots of money by private companies trying to solve these problems. And I think if there's, if public employment services can harness these tools and help to sort of build an ecosystem of credible skill signaling and job search and the tools to use all of those things, then people, and then you can sort of help somebody self-define what their preferred outcome is and help bring those tools together to meet that outcome and then measure against that. Um, I, will, I will sort of then also say generally, I think that networking is a really underutilized tool for job search. We have very direct on the ground experience that a person who is connected to a company on LinkedIn is 10 times more likely to get an interview at that company. Uh, that, that, is, that is true uh, as we've measured it globally. It is also true that networks, personal and professional networks, are a very important source of career availability information. I, can nev I can't really think about what it takes to be a data scientist if I don't know what a data scientist actually looks and feels like and what kind of education they had. And personal connections to people, right, in those kinds of jobs really do facilitate career exploration and discovery um, in ways that just sort of knowing what a data scientist is does not. Um, and there, we are finding out more and more, especially because of the value of the LinkedIn platform is in professional networking, how important they are for uh, career mobility, job connection, um, and advancement. And um, there is... There is, I mean, and, and I will say that sort of there's always this chicken and egg problem. The tools that you have are only as good as the people that can use them, right? You need to, I mean, a hammer is a hammer. And a hammer is very different to me than it is to a master carpenter. Uh, and so, you know, the, the tool is the same and the ability to use and get value out of that tool varies widely across people. And I think public employment services really have an opportunity um, to help people use tools and also to make those tools better. There's no good reason whatsoever why a job should only be available through the government workforce board. It should be available there. It should be available on LinkedIn. It should be available on Indeed. It should be available everywhere so that whatever mechanism or tool a job seeker is using or PES is using to find out what jobs are available, they can have it through any mechanism whatsoever. Um, and that can, that mathematically, that only increases the chances of connecting the right person to the right job. I think freedom of access and information and then becoming, mastering the tools of job search and signaling um, and learning how to leverage your own professional networks uh, to connect to those jobs. I think PES really has uh, an opportunity to support people to sort of build their own professional identities online to connect with people who can help them achieve whatever their self-determined goals are. Wow, fantastic. Karen? Great. Well, I, I mean, maybe to complement some of these things, I might just highlight some of the functions that we need to think about in supporting job seekers. And uh, we heard a lot yesterday about the importance of um, dialogue also with employers. And there was a lot of discussion about the importance of helping the HR people uh, in these companies understand what they're actually looking for, helping them to, to articulate it in ways that then these different networks and platforms can also be more effective. So I think that's one interesting area where um, maybe it's not always a function depending on what country you're in of your public employment service, but, the, but being able to do that I think um, and building that trust and that partnership because for some of the kinds of programs for the maybe the, le the less advantaged who are maybe a bit less savvy um, and are you know maybe not as likely to be um, using LinkedIn or others um, that they're going to need a different uh, maybe a, in some elements or maybe these technology platforms just need to be adapted um, to that population as they're as they're increasingly using it I mean that's another it's another issue to think about um, but I, but I think also just the um, so this sort of employer outreach type function 
um, is facilitated by platforms, but is also facilitated by, you know, trust, confidence, and, and, and human connections that can, that can help uh, bid, uh, build those bridges. Um, and, you know, the skills that Liz was mentioning, I just want to highlight, you know, when we look at, we just our SME Outlook earlier this year, and one of the big challenges with digitalization in general, it's not the technical skills per se, although you can find those on the market and might cost you a little more than you want to pay, but, uh, but that's, li that's life, um, is it's really the sort of soft and managerial skills and understanding how to use it. And so this is true for for SMEs, um, it's going to be true for public employment services, et cetera. And so um, understanding how to also do the skill set and training within the public employment services, I think something that will help them then be able to better uh, support job seekers. Um, I, you know, this, um, this identification of, of tasks, um, I mean, even Liz gave the example yesterday of, of the changing nature of what a, a community college math teacher, would, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, so I, found that, I found that analogy or that example really powerful because it's saying that it's not, it's, it's having this finer understanding um, as somebody who's helping people seek jobs, what is really that job about? And because the occupational code might stay the same, but what you're actually doing is changing a lot. And so that's another area where I think if public employment services are effectively equipped in, the, in that, um, they can do an uh, even more effective job at, at, at matching. Um, but, but I think one thing that in, I'd love to hear about uh, from, from the, the folks that are on the front lines that are in the room here is, you know, for those that are the most disadvantaged, because that's what those, these global trends are really highlighting. It's, it's the communities and the people that, are, um, that have the lowest set of skills that are going to find some of the challenges. Now, there's going to be a lot of the, the care service type work, and the aging population will mean that that's... Uh, you know, increasingly uh, an area of job growth. Um, the challenge is going to be the wages and what that means for, you know, purchasing power. Um, and, you know, Carmen was talking about the middle class, and as I was saying yesterday, that, that one of the challenges is that the, um, the lifestyles that people are thinking about, and as jobs are automated and maybe those jobs paid better than what are available in the market and, and how public employment services can help people get maybe a more realistic understanding um, of what's out there and that maybe things have changed a little bit and that you kind of have to make a transition. Or maybe, you know, uh, you know, and I think in OECD countries, a lot of that automation is also affecting, um, is affecting men who are used to be in the kinds of jobs that it's harder for them maybe psychologically to make the transition. Um, and so there's a change in the demographics of who's working and who's earning what in households that has all sorts of other social implications. So, um, so I think if public employment services have that holistic view as well, that can, that can also um, effectively support their job seekers placement function? Well, all of you were talking about different dimensions. Let me try to wrap up uh, this question. So Carmen has mentioned some hammers. She said, well, you need to have some tools, guidance tools, matching tools. Uh, I would add one more small little hammer in there, which is data quality. Uh, and when I mean data quality, it's not only the quality of the data, but it's also the privacy and the tools to ensure that when we're managing citizens' data, remember we are managing someone else's data. It's not our data. So the principles of respecting people's data is within that hammer that we also need to have. But then Liz said, well, you can have the hammers, but open data... Uh, taking advantage of existing tools that have been already built there, that have already learned in AI, in machine learning, uh, why not? I mean, uh, if we can take a citizen in the past and when they walk out, they are a little bit more digital, they have an email, they have access to these tools, that can also help. And then I think you mentioned the third dimension, which is a tool and a process is not enough there will always be the need of trust, of, I would say, human, uh, uh, this human approach to uh, specifically communities that need help, that there is no technology, no process, and no tools that will replace uh, a warm welcome to a person who is maybe wanting a better life, uh, but they need to find someone else to look at their eyes. And finally, uh, I think a key part of this is uh, closeness and trust on the enterprise level. Talk to the human resources of, of our main vacancy generators. 
and make them understand about the tools so that they can adopt it, but also the key role that they do have uh, when it's time to use the tools and, and the open data uh, in order to achieve success. So fantastic three views. So last question, and then we can open discussion, is that the technological innovations are arriving. <laughs> and they are, as we can see now, 60% temporary contracts and 3% platform-based. They arrive faster that we can imagine. And this is what we call the exponential uh, fourth revolution. And they are creating opportunities, but they are creating threats and challenges, not only for the workers, but also for the public employment services. While technology brings the possibility to create more effective and efficient workflows, many public employment services are being held back by, by lack of resources and also resistance within the organization. I mean, I've been always doing the form fill out. I'm, I only know how to do forms and then type forms into an Excel file, and that is my data. So big question, what is public employment services uh, can do to fully reap the benefits of current and future technologies and become more effective, efficient, and have greater levels of customer satisfactions? I mean, I cannot stop thinking about the WhatsApp bots that are everywhere today. Will they replace the people who today is filling forms in public employment services? How can public employment services reap the benefits of that technology and change themselves to a better customer satisfaction. Carmen, your thoughts? Well, I think public employment services are going through the same, many of the same challenges that companies are going through. I mean, on the one hand, we have the opportunity of the digital transformation. It means a lot of the processes that we do today manually can be automated and made more efficient. At the same time, uh, we face the challenge that those people that were doing the job are resistant. They say, well, I mean, this is my job, so now what am I going to do? And I think part of the re solution has to do with change management. It's, this is key. I mean, understanding that this means a change of tasks, that precisely because we are liberating work from people that are doing routine-based, maybe work that's important, but it doesn't add that much value at the end of the day, that what makes us special as a service is this the human touch, the, the, able, the possibility to have a more one-on-one -on -one time, and that these old feeling forms at the end of the day is something we have to do, but it's not that um, maybe that exciting. So can we change people's minds to realize that the work that we can do now, it's, 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 it's better work for the person, it's better work for the customer, uh, for the companies, for the, for, the, for the workers. Can we create, and again, as companies are doing today, can we create training and retraining within the, comp within the PS to, to support people in their changing roles? Can we provide them with clear paths on how to get from where they are now to where they are in the future? Can we convince them that this is actually at the end of the day, uh, they're going to have a better job than what they have today. I think this is the role, and, and, and here the soft skills, the management is key. I mean, they are, this implies a new organization of labor, uh, a one that if it's well done, it's more efficient, it's more probably at the end will have a better human touch, people will be doing less routine and more people-centric jobs, they'll be spending more time with clients that, are, that, that have more difficulties, you'll be able to, to have more um, people allocated to these difficult cases that require a lot of support and less to the cases that can help themselves with all the tools that are available. Also, I think it's important that people understand the potentiality of these tools. I mean, uh, these tools provide great um, support, but only if you... Many people that come to DPS don't have the digital skills to benefit from this. And so the person that is there supporting the, 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 the job search of people are the intermediaries that are the ones who can make sense of these tools for them. But it's important that these people, uh, the, the, the PS um, counselors, PS um, staff, understands the potentiality of the tools and is able to explain it and, and make sense, to help other people make sense of it. So it's really a, a big change in, in the task. Uh, it's from, from filling forms, from doing administrative type of work to more human-centric work, 
and, and, and spending more time with people that really need it and, and less time with people that, that can help themselves through the new tools now. So I think it's great, exciting work ahead, but from the standing point of management and, 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 and transformation, a big task uh, that has to be organized and, 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 and with a lot of human touch so people feel confident that at the end of the day they'll be better off and themselves and the clients that they help, um, that they support. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Liz? Uh, oh, if only there was a technology that would solve for the problems of human uh, social organization. <coughs> um, there's, you know, the, the, there have been many great technologies that have fallen short of their promise because they could not be implemented in the human social environments in which they were injected. Um, so I think your question is really key, and obviously all PES services are different. Um, I think so the in my experience the the easiest technology to inject is one that makes someone's life immediately and observably easier right and I think that there's I mean PES services will have to think about how can I transition right one task or function that was being done what's that per you it really takes an understanding of what's that person's pain point in doing their current job the person who's filling out forms, that is one, not the only thing that they do in their job very likely. They probably do some other tasks that they would prefer to do more of if they weren't so busy filling out all of these forms because I've never met a single person in life who thought that filling out forms was particularly stimulating part of their job. Uh, but it is a part of their job. And so right to really make that change and to get that buy-in, I think that you need strong leadership, but you also need to help people who may feel threatened to see that opportunity oh, this technology is going to make my life easier so that I can do my job better, so that I can serve those people, right? So, and, and also, we don't need to go from filling out paper forms to AI chat boxes uh, overnight, right? There's, that's not likely to happen. There's an incrementality that I think, um, you know, organizational change really benefits from. So teach me how to do my job a little bit better. Don't create an extra step for me. Remove a step for me. Uh, remove a thing that I currently don't really enjoy doing and free me up to do something that I think is much more motivated towards the mission. Um, and I think that that will go a long way to gaining acceptance. Um, changes at the margin tend to be much, much more effective than sort of instituting a new technology because that's such a shock uh, to the system. Um, do you guys, I mean, I, I always think of like a bonsai tree, right? So you can't, cr you can't turn a fully grown, right? You sort of, bonsai trees take years, right? You have to sort of carefully prune them around the edges just little by little, right? Because if you cut off too much, it'll shock the tree and the tree will die. Um, and then sort of all that work goes down the drain. And so these sort of marginal changes over time create something that's really beautiful and enduring and that is then eventually self-sustaining. And so I think, you know, that is really, in my own experience, the way to sort of push forward digitization and increasing digital capacity and then to sort of start, get, get your vision and then work all the way back. Say like, how, how can we make a technology work for every person that is involved right in this process? And I think you'll actually find that you don't eliminate work for people, you just expand the set of things that they can do to actually provide those value added uh, services for, for job seekers. Yeah, I, I like the tree example. Karen? Yeah, I was just thinking I have so little patience to do the bonsai tree personally, <laughs> but, um, but uh, so maybe I'm not the worst one for that. Um, but, you know, a, a couple of thoughts. One, just to clarify the statistics, uh, just to make sure that uh, we, don't uh, we don't misquote here. Um, just that it's, it's one in nine are currently in temporary contracts in the OECD. It was just that 60% of the new job growth in yes. Europe's right. just Correct. to make sure. Thanks um, for and, the then, and then one in seven um, are self-employed. So that, just to clarify that, just to make sure that uh, I don't leave you with a, a misperception and get, uh, get in trouble when I go back home. Um, so, you know, on, one of the things I was thinking about for, for this question was also um, the kind of, the pool of people that you're working with. Because one of the areas we've been looking at um, trying to understand better is the economically inactive. And so one of the trends in the OECD countries is unemployment rates in many places are at an all-time low. But then you have some folks who are remaining outside of the labor market. And they're not sort of on the different systems. They're not registered in the technology systems um, that a public employment service might see them. Uh, and so helping to make a bit visible how technology can help with some of these administrative records and understanding a bit. Now, for some people who are maybe on disability just so they don't have to work, maybe that's not the, you know, 
maybe they don't like that, but, um, but it does mean that there are opportunities to even increase the outreach um, of the populations that are being served and how to help them also access uh, the labor market. Um, there are discouraged workers, there are people with all sorts of other uh, barriers, and we talked about the aging population and how to help with, um, you know, how to have maybe some, some specialized knowledge of how to help firms and workers understand how to make the right kind of adaptations. And that can also be true for people with mental health issues, can be true for all sorts of other things. And so, um, so you know, I think the technology can help with understanding a bit more what are the different populations. Um, it requires connecting different admin systems across governments, which is notoriously challenging. We heard some ex interesting examples in, uh, in Michigan yesterday about some things that they're trying to do to connect data sets. But I think that that sort of data infrastructure to better understand what's going on um, will be exciting. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear about all the sort of initiatives that are being done. You know, Australia, I think uh, we have somebody from Australia here with Digital First, which is interesting, but, and, and maybe you can tell us about it, but, you know, because they're trying to understand that there are some people who are not going to be as digitally capable as others, and so having sort of layered service in order to, to meet that need, or, or the um, artificial intelligence, there are some, some folks like in Flanders, I think maybe even uh, in, in, in France, I, I was talking to an NGO that's looking at how to use AI for, um, you know, for public good, because a lot of money is going into AI. Um, there are some academic articles that are challenging, you know, it, it's the sort of debate, is it going to help, is it going to sort of institute, uh, re it sort of reinforce existing biases based on how the algorithms are developed. Um, so we have some interesting questions to address and how the technology is going to be used. Um, but I think these are things that we have to not be afraid of. We just have to understand what's going on and then, and then go forth and experiment. And I think that's another thing where institutional frameworks and countries don't always allow for the experimentation and public service delivery because there are sort of mandates for equal public treatment that mean that it's a little bit harder. So innovation in the public sector um, is one area that I think also could be a cha it could be interesting for public employment services and how technology can help them better track. Uh, I mean, we just got the Nobel Prizes were, you know, about randomized control trials and, and things where you actually, you do experiments and see what works and you try to understand with behavioral insights how people respond to different activities. And with all of these new technologies, we're going to have to do some tests. And so making sure that that uh, space for experimentation um, takes place is another interesting uh, issue. I think that some rules and regulations need to be maybe revisited in order, in order to do that. Um, and then I think, you know, another issue we, we heard yesterday was, um, you know, there are certain kinds of um, organizations that are used to working with certain kinds of difficult to serve populations and how to, how can, um, you know, how can that technology that's used also in public employment services also be shared in ways that can help all of these other uh, grassroots organizations that are also sort of helping to fight the good fight together with, uh, with the public employment services and, and, and how, can we, how can we bring them all together. So. Oh, thank you. What, what I would like to add, Carmen, uh, she mentioned, you mentioned today that AIDB is working to help uh, around seven uh, countries on their tools, the hammers, to improve the public employment services. And I've been closing, uh, working on that. And some of the conclusions that we are arriving uh, on these seven cases is that at the end of the day, they, oops, <laughs> whoever was sleeping, it's now up. That was on purpose. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at the end of the day, the willing of every country uh, arrive around the same des design. So with some differences on priorities and what you do first, etc. But it's like the tools we mentioned here, uh, maybe a little bit more detailed, uh, data, guidance, uh, put the facilitator on the human touch side, try to reduce uh, repetitive work, uh, put some social uh, media and social networks like chat in the front line, make their life easier. And the tools to do that, they are around the same. So I will strongly encourage also public employment services to network among themselves. Uh, and and the other thing that I, I, I find very interesting is that if we do have reliable, uh, and I would say timely, administrative information, uh, 
pests can become donors of very useful data for governments, for their e-government, online tramits, whatever the government is doing. Interconnection among uh, public employment services and ministries of labor or whatever the organization is and the rest definitely is a to-do within the tools. To consume data coming from outside but also to donate administrative data and one one of the use cases that we see is uh, for example conditioning uh, conditional uh, benefits to citizens uh, in situation of vulnerability because many of these services require is this guy is, is this guy working is this guy looking for a job so there is this magic question that I, the yes or no is a condition to give benefits. So our role is not only to see within our own service and put some tools to whatever it is, but it's also to look outside the woods and see what other trees are there that we can link to each other. So there's two networking challenges here. One is among among countries, because you guys are exactly in the same page and you are guys uh, want the same. So networking in, in Latin America between, and why not with other countries like Australia, uh, to see you know, good, good practices and share, plus uh, connection within other uh, outside pairs with other institutions or government uh, databases. So we're closing the, and opening the floor for questions, or it's gone? It's so fast. Uh, we're actually on schedule as it is. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have the keynote. So the one thing that we want to do a little bit differently today, just because yesterday we saw such great questions and we all wish we had time for more, we do have um, some flashcards that if you have a question that's burning and you want the answer, we're more than happy to collect them and get these answers for you um, from their panelists or you know as, as a group because we want to make sure that you're, you're heard and that your questions are answered. So um, we'll have those for you. Um, to ask the panel, of course, we have a, a coffee break in a few if you want to catch up with the panelists, but we have to move to the, to the next one. So I apologize for the timing, but we do want to hear these questions, so please uh, fill out these flashcards so we can collect them and get those answered for you. Okay, so no time for questions. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Guillermo. No. <laughs> and I said at the beginning, sorry, I did not meet my promise, so I promise we're, we're, we're going to be available in the coffee break for questions. I, I'm very sorry. It's too, I mean, it, that's the problem when you put too many women in a panel, you know? <laughs> that's the problem. We should have a guy here. Thank you. Thank you very much.